Our scripture today is from Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and can be found on page 1497 in your pew Bibles. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means last among, least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. This week, most of the Christian world will celebrate the Feast of Epiphany. January 6th marks the day when the wise men came bearing gifts as they paid tribute to the Christ child. They had traveled long and hard to find him. Now, we don't know a lot about these men. They were obviously important, wealthy men who studied the stars. We don't know how many there were. We traditionally say there were three, but there could have been many more. We chose the number three because of the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. We don't know their names, although tradition has established potential names for them, but, but still, that's tradition and maybe not verified in reality or truth. There's speculation that they may have lived hundreds of miles away and the preparation for their trip may have taken a while. We're told by the historians that, that actually the wise men did not arrive until nearly two years later after the birth of Christ. We still have our traditions and we love to picture that stable scene with the manger and the angels and, and the shepherds and the wise men together because that scene the symbolism of all those people coming together remind us that this was a world-stopping event, that the ends of the earth had even come in to worship the Christ child. I think about those wise men, and I think that when they were setting off on their journey, I'm so thankful that they had a star shining brightly above to lead them. You see, they recognized the precious gift that was there in the child when they arrived. They knew that at the end of their journey, they would find the most precious gift that had ever been given. They weren't sure what they would find. But in Jesus, they saw the embodiment of God's love. You know, Christmas has come and gone, but I hope you don't miss the point. God's most precious gifts and possessions are often disguised and hidden in the commonplace. The good news is that God gives us signs like the star to point to them. But the truth is you'll only find them if you're looking for them. I, I can't tell you how many times over the years someone has said to me, you've got to go out and look at the stars tonight. Something major is happening. Mars is passing Saturn. Or there's going to be the Aurora Borealis. And... 10 o'clock comes and I'm in bed and I miss it. You know, sometimes the most special and precious things are missed because either we're too tired or we're not looking or we take for granted the things 
that we have all around us. There's a story that goes back several years. Actually, it was the spring of 1844. The story goes that a young German scholar made a remarkable discovery. His journey brought him to an old Greek Orthodox monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. He was invited by the Russian monks who lived there to spend the night. In the bitterly cold night, the monks brought out a basket of, of looked like wooded materials for him to burn in the fireplace to keep warm. It was made of pieces of vellum and pieces of cordwood, and the young man was warming his hands at the fire when his eyes caught sight on one of the pieces of vellum there that, that there was some writing on it. And so he quickly pulled that out of the fire, extinguished the embers, and he began to recognize the writing as part of the Greek Bible. He began digging through the baskets and came up with, with what ended up to be 129 pages of what was the oldest manuscript of the Bible to be discovered until that day. And they were using it as firewood to light the fire. The monks could see that he was excited. They didn't understand why he could be so excited over firewood, over this vellum that they used every day to warm themselves. And when he told them what it was, suddenly they realized they had a precious treasure. He was able to take some of it with him on his journey, and the rest of it was turned over to Mother Russia at that time. It was not until 1933 and the Russian communists agreed to sell the Codex, and I can't say this, Sinaiticus to Great Britain for a sum of $250,000, one of the most expensive books ever sold in the world. It was precious treasure, and they almost missed it. Those monks didn't know what they had. You know, we all dream about finding treasure, we have these little things, you know, if you're Irish, you know about the rainbow and the pot of gold, right? And some of us are looking all our lives for that pot of gold, and yet we don't recognize what is right in front of us, the precious treasure that God has given us. What's your most treasured possession? Most of us would rightly say that it is someone that we love, someone in our household, someone who is a part of our lives. It's true in our relationship with God as well. God loves you and me, and He considers us the most precious, precious gift that He has. God loves you and me, and He doesn't want to lose us. And that's what Christmas is all about. Because as we know from the fall of creation and the early writings in Genesis, we turned our back on God, and we've been struggling with the fall ever since. And Christmas tells us that God was ready to do whatever He could to redeem us and bring us home and make us whole again. That gift, that child, marked you and me as God's own because it was His gift to us. The wise men were seeking for meaning and purpose, and the star led them to Jesus. And they knew that He was a gift from God thanks to that star. You know, have you read the book of Ephesians lately? I know we have a new, this is a commercial time, we have a new adult Bible study meeting at 9 o'clock, and they're studying the book of Colossians. And I'd love to see some of you come and join that class as you get into God's Word. Well, another great book is the book of Ephesians, and I want to just read you a little bit. Now, I apologize because Paul, as so often, gets so excited that he, he gives us run-on sentences. And as he opens his letter... He says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves." In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. You see, Paul's writing about the gift of the child, that one that the wise men came seeking and found, that in that child, God had planned from the beginning of time to reach out to us and to call us back into the family. 
Paul writes again, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus was the means of us coming home to God. We are the focus of Paul's writing in that passage. God's actions all centered on claiming us as his very own and begins with our redemption. For God so loved the world. And again, that's you and me. God so loved us. He loved us so much that he sent his son into the world. And that's Christmas. So that we might have eternal life. In other words, we might be with him forever. I hate to take down the Christmas decorations. I love Christmas and the celebration. Last night it was with great sadness I took down our tree. Put all the ornaments away. This week we're going to be taking down some of the decorations here in church. And I always have felt over the years in the churches I've served, it's one of the saddest days in church life. Because the church seems so empty afterwards. Because we take away all the signs and symbols of that great gift of Christmas. And yet the good news is, is that just because you take the decorations down does not mean that Jesus leaves and goes into hibernation. God loves us so much that that gift is not just a one-day gift. It's a gift for eternity. It's a gift that says that we can have eternal life. And we can be with him forever. There's a song that I love that says, Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. That's the great message of Christmas. That's the message that the wise men discovered as they came to the manger. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians that we have been redeemed. Redemption is a theological term that we don't use a lot anymore. I know that a generation ago we talked about redeeming green stamps. Anybody remember green stamps? I was just a little boy, but I remember. <clears throat> redemption is this theological term. And to God, redemption is the process where he reclaimed us as his own. He redeemed us, he took us, and he gave us a new name and a new life and a new eternity that's why the wise men were so excited. You know, the, the story of Ecclesiastes and the great preacher there writing is trying to discover what the meaning of life is, and he says everything is vanity. And there's no doubt that the wise men in their countries with all their wealth, with all their knowledge and understanding, still felt that life was meaningless until they saw the star. And they had read the text saying that God was going to do a great thing, and they began to search you know, there are people who are searching today and they're looking for some meaning, some purpose in life and they try all kinds of things and they have not been able to find it. Now, there are different Greek words which have been translated for the idea of redemption. The first means to purchase. When we think of making a purchase, we, when we think of buying groceries or maybe buying a new car or a house, it's a transaction. And that is one meaning of that word redemption. This for that, a simple transaction. A second word means to purchase out. And, and it's slightly different than the first. It gives depth. I go into the store and I buy a new coat and then I wear it out of the store and it's mine now. So I purchase it, but I take it and I, I claim it as my own. But there's a third word, which means to release or set free. That's the word used in Ephesians. And it is usually used in terms of slavery. It was used when a person bought a slave and then set him free. That man was redeemed. The price was paid so that he could be free. And that's the meaning of the word that Paul uses in Ephesians 1. That in Christ we have been redeemed and set free. That's why he can later say that we were a new creation. Because we're not bound to the past anymore. That now we can live to the glory of God. Because we are free. We've been redeemed. In a few minutes we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this is what we're remembering in that. Like the star it points to the gift of the new life we have in Christ. Like the star it points us to the gift of that life that we have now. Think about this. Do you remember that scene in A Christmas Carol when Scrooge meets his old friend Marley, 
right in the beginning of the story. And, and Marley is carrying heavy chains, which he said were forged by the actions of his life. We get a sense of who Scrooge is, a miserly, spiteful, angry, mean person. And Marley says, you and I are the same, and you are forging the chains of your life right now, and you will bear them into eternity. What a wonderful illustration of what sin does to a person. The truth is that all of us are bound by those chains that weigh us down and hold us hostage. But in Christ, the babe of Bethlehem, we are set free to begin again. He redeemed us, and now we are that new person. The past has no hold on us. We can begin to live anew because of that child. What a great message for New Year's. In Christ, we can start over. The past is now gone forever. That's why every year I go back to Weight Watchers in January. (laughs) The truth is there are some of those things that we're going to make resolutions. We're going to try to do things differently. We're going to be in church every week. We're going to read our Bible every day. We're going to lose weight. We're going to start walking, jogging, whatever it is. We're going to save money. And Sometimes we'll fail and sometimes we'll be successful. But we'll be successful in all that and more If we look to our little buddy, see, my my little fireman guy is gone. But Jesus is here, and he will be with you all year long. The past is gone forever, and we are new. Scrooge got that message at the end of that story. At the end of the story, he became as good as his word and passed on the blessing to everyone who knew him. Scrooge's story is a parable of what the redeemed life should look like. First, since we've been forgiven, we should be forgiving people. That's what Jesus was alluding to in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us, now Jonathan, here's the third one. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Whether you use trespass, debt, or sin, the idea is the same. We forgive those who've hurt us. We forgive those who have trampled over us and our rights, just as Jesus has done. Second, since we've been blessed, we should pass on the blessings. There's no doubt in my mind that when those wise men, those magi went back to their home country, and you notice those words in there, it's like a narration in parentheses that Herod wanted them to go back and tell him where the baby was. It says, no, they went another way. They did not go back to Herod. And we can be sure, and some of the roots of our Christianity in the Far East relate back to those wise men because they were sharing the blessings of that day. We need to be given living life with His peace and His joy and His prosperity. All that God has is now ours. God not only redeemed us, He made us joint heirs with Jesus. We should live life claiming those blessings and then pass them on. We've been given an inheritance beyond belief, yet many of us don't seem to realize it. The Lord loves us. There's a story told about a man named Dr. Livingston, and he had a medical condition which required him to drink goat's milk. And he visited one day by a tribal king, And he noticed that the king was eyeing his goat. And so what he did was what most of us would have done. The king is eyeing your prized possession, something that you value very much. In order of gesture of goodwill, he gave the goat to the king. And in exchange, the king gave him his rod. Afterwards, Dr. Livingston felt in a quandary because he went back and he said to his friend, he said, I'm in trouble here. I gave up that which is most precious to me. I need that goat's milk. And what am I going to do with this rod? And as Fred said to him, I don't think you understand. That's not just any rod. That's the scepter of the king. And as you hold that scepter, that means that anything in the kingdom now belongs to you. So before you had one goat, now every goat in the kingdom is yours. You see, that's the kind of blessing we have in Christ now, that we are children of the heavenly king. Jesus was born, and now the gospel tells us he is our brother and that God is our father. That's why he's always with us. That's why we can depend on him, because he loves us like we were his son and his daughters. 
As we stand at the brink of a new year, I urge you to claim your status as God's beloved son or daughter. Take your inheritance and spread God's grace everywhere you go. This hurting world needs us, and there's good news to share. You and I, believe it or not, are the stars that others will see that will lead them to Christ. As we go boldly forth in Christ's name, living to his glory, others will see us and they too will be led by the star to the child. So shine brightly with the love of God so that all the world may rejoice. Amen. We're going to sing together verses 1 and 4 of God of Grace and Glory, number 669.